Welcome everyone to News Literacy and How to Recognize Fact from Fiction. As social media users or influencers, we have a responsibility to recognize factual news before sharing it to our audience, friends, and family. We must educate ourselves to stop the spread of misinformation and instead amplify truth and facts. My name is Paola Mendez, and I am the founder of the Blogger Union. The Blogger Union is a network of blogger communities dedicated to growing our members' brands and incomes through meetups and workshops just like this one. We have communities all over the US. Uh, I run the South Florida bloggers in the Miami area, but we also have the New York City bloggers, DC bloggers, Houston bloggers, and a bunch of others if you'd like to check that out at thebloggerunion.com. Let me introduce our speakers today. Ebony Rice is the vice president of the News Literacy Projects Educator Network. She is a strategic coalition builder and community engagement expert who has spent her career successfully scaling up campaigns and programs in the pursuit of equal access for all. She holds a bachelor's and master's degree in communication from the University of Southern California Annenberg School of Communication and Journalism. Welcome, Ebony. <laughs> um, our next speaker is Lance Dixon. Lance Dixon is WLRN's digital editor. He's worked as a professional journalist in his hometown of Miami since 2013. Before joining the WLRN newsroom, Lance served as director and storytelling producer at The New Tropic, a hyper-local news outlet that covers South Florida culture, civic engagement, and more through a daily newsletter. Before that, Lance was a general assignment and municipal government reporter at the Miami Herald, covering the day-to-day -day happenings of various city halls, along with other enterprise and breaking news coverage. Welcome, Lance. And finally, co-moderating with me is Alicia. She has been always been a social butterfly and someone who enjoys a good conversation about all that life brings. In 2014, she started HeyAlicia.com, a blog about her travel experiences, joy, motivation, inspiration, and sass. Welcome, everyone. We're so excited to have you here today. And would you mind each of you um, just telling us a little bit about yourself before we get started? And we'll start with Ebony. <laughs> Okay, awesome. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Ebony Rice. And as Paula said, I am with the News Literacy Project. And my work really focuses on mobilizing communities on the ground to build a local footprint uh, among educators to um, teach news literacy to students because we believe that news literacy is very central to a democracy and to civic engagement. Um, and so I'm really excited to be having this conversation today. Um, it's extremely timely and um, I'm looking forward to engaging with you all more as the evening progresses. Wonderful, well, welcome. We're so excited to share this conversation with you. Uh, would you mind introducing yourself, Lance? Not at all, Paula. Um, I, uh, again, as, as, a, as was stated, I'm Lance Dixon, uh, digital editor at WLRN, and um, I have been working in news in Miami for, uh, you know, the past seven years or so, um, and grew up here uh, reading the Herald and so forth, and this topic is one that's really important to me, I'm obviously heading into the election in less than two weeks, and just in general, um, a big thing for me is is trying to help make the news plain for folks and it's something that I've always been really passionate about in my work at the outlets I've been at so far and so I'm um, looking forward to getting into the conversation and hopefully helping to get through all the noise uh, that's out there so that folks can really help uh, inform their communities and educate themselves a little bit too. That's wonderful. I really found your um, voter guides that you did with the new tropic so helpful. So your work of making the news easy for people is definitely coming through. And Alicia, would you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about yourself? Absolutely. Well, hi, everyone. Again, I'm Alicia. Uh, like Paula said, I have been uh, blogging and influencing since about 2014. Um, I am raised in South Florida. I'm a Florida girl um, in Miami and Broward. Um, so I'm really excited. <laughs> I'm really excited to 
uh, to be here and to um, you know talk about this. I think it's very timely. Um, I am a huge um, uh, curator of all different types of people. I like to talk about a lot of different topics, topics politics being one of them, um, and just social causes and um, and just justice for everyone. Um, so I'm very excited to be here. Um, you can connect with me um, at heyalicia.com. It's where I have all of my information. And thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us, Alicia. So tonight we will be speaking with Lance and Ebony about how we can learn to become news literate. Additionally, they will share resources and tools in order for us as educators or parents to teach our youth how to do the same. So I think let's get started. Um, what is news literacy about and why is it important? Would um, Ebony, you would like to go first? Sure. Um, I, I'll uh, kick this conversation off um, and then pass it along to Lance. So very simply, news literacy is the ability to determine credible news and other information that you see, um, however you see it. And so we believe that news literacy is really the cornerstone to a democracy, um, understanding the um, First Amendment and the right to free speech and free press. Um, we believe in protecting that. Um, we believe that in order to have a really healthy democracy that the citizenry has to know how to um, pursue news literacy and has to know how to uh, determine what information is real and what information isn't real online, um, which is why I'm so excited about this conversation because our entire platform focuses on making sure that educators um, can teach news literacy to students. Um, again, because we believe that it's just so important and it's a life skill. Um, because we live in the most complex information landscape that we've ever lived in before. And so without news literacy skills, um, it's just really difficult to navigate. It's really difficult to be well-informed. It's extremely difficult to be civically engaged. And so we provide resources and tools to help educators teach, but also uh, we provide resources and tools for the general public so that anybody who has a vested interest in news literacy um, can be engaged, can know the issues and can be well-informed and participate in our democracy. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I don't have too much more to add to what Ebony has shared. Um, I think that was a great definition. Um, I think that just on a, on a practical level, too, the reason it's so important is because of the way that news is disseminated and, and distributed to folks these days. So naturally, the journalism industry and news producing has had to really stretch its arms out and embrace uh, social media. And so the good parts of that are when, you know, those news outlets and folks who are bloggers and curators of information can put that information out there and make it really accessible. But the danger in that is when uh, folks, you know, misinterpret things when they misuse that sort of platform that they have. And, and it's not even always intentional. Sometimes it's, there's no malice involved, but they might put some information out there that's not totally founded on, on you know, the full facts or partial facts and things like that. And so I, I think now more than ever, because so many of us are getting things through, whether it's, you know, Instagram infographics or, you know, we're, we're scrolling through Facebook or Twitter, or all those sorts of places. Now more than ever, uh, it's really important to be able to separate fact and fiction as, as Ebony was stating, so. Absolutely. And I feel like I, it, this is like a new concept for me. I didn't realize that like you have that responsibility as a consumer um, until recently. So I'm glad we're having this conversation. And uh, let's get started with maybe uh, you both talked about facts and misinformation. Uh, maybe um, would you guys help us understand what is a fact and what is misinformation? So maybe Lance can get start with that one. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, so I think a fact is something that can be properly verified that there's like, you know, demonstrable, like demonstrated proof of the information that's being presented. Um, I think that that part of what's made this such a sticky and tricky thing for folks is that opinion is often loud and it's often the thing that drums up a lot of emotion, but, but fact is really what you have to, you know, stake your claim on and, and, and really proceed with. And misinformation by that same token, uh, you know, like I was saying before, like it's not always that 
people necessarily want to spread or put out misinformation. Uh, but but often if they're sharing things with the best intention, I mean, I think this has happened a lot this year as folks have shared information on ways to support causes that they're passionate about or as protests sprung up around the country and things like that. There was a lot of misinformation out there. Not all of it was, you know, poorly intended. Some of it was just people who were really passionate and, and trying to get the word out there, but you have to be very careful that, that you can verify what you're seeing. And so that's that's where that kind of dividing line uh, comes. I, I love that. And um, thank you, Lance, for kind of um, differentiating how misinformation is um, often, it's just really hard to determine the intention behind something that's shared online. And so um, there are a lot of things that are shared um, under the kind of umbrella of misinformation and it can be satire or somebody wrote it as a joke and then someone sees it and they spread it um, thinking that it's real and thinking that it's true. And so this happens um, all the time. You see it on social media where people share things with like very earnest intentions, um, but it just is false and it's fake. And so um, while there is the onus on um, journalists and a lot of journalists practice standard-based journalism practices, but also on the consumers to verify the information that we're seeing so that we aren't guilty of spreading misinformation knowingly or um, unknowingly on our news feeds. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Um, and I think it's uh, good for everyone to hear what the facts, what's misinformation. So um, that was a good clarification from both of you. Um, now it brings me actually to the next question, which is a multiple uh, part question, but let's get into um, the steps that a journalist needs to take in order to publish a report or news story. Um, what are the specific steps or standards that all journalists are expected to follow in order to verify their sources or fact check? Um, and if so, could you please quickly um, summarize that process for us? I think as a resident journalist, I'll let I think <laughs> Lance, <laughs> Lance, I don't know if you want to grab that one. <laughs> uh, no, it's totally fine with me. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, essentially, it's a, it's a sort of fact-finding operation in a lot of cases. So we hear about a story, we hear about a potential issue, we hear about something that someone has brought to our attention, and then our next step is to, okay, how can we figure out what's actually going on here? You know, it kind of goes back to what I think a lot of folks understand with the, you know, the five W's and, and H, you know, just who, what, where, when, why, and how uh, something happened. Uh, but obviously, it goes a bit beyond that. Uh, with the ways that technology and like our sort of digital landscape happens. So sometimes it can take a little more work than just the sort of basics, but yeah, you know, you, you, you get a tip or you get um, some information presented to you and you pursue it. Um, you, you know, you reach out to sources or the folks who are most directly impacted by the situation and try your best to verify what they've shared um, to sort of pull out again from that emotion. Cause I think sometimes when folks you know, hear about something, they'll just, you know, we'll take the election, for example, they'll say, oh, this is voter suppression because blah, blah, blah happened at my polling place. And it might just be that they didn't understand that they couldn't walk uh, past a certain designated line where only poll workers mm -hmm. can be. So, you know, if you're not careful, you present that information and it's just, oh, voter suppression happened at a polling place in, you know, Coral Gables, but might have actually just been that that person couldn't go beyond that certain line. And so that's where you, you know, you reach out to sources, you reach out to people who can verify that stuff. Um, and then you put the story together and then uh, you pass it along to a person like me in an editor role who, uh, you know, takes a, a, a sharp eye and looks at it uh, to make sure that all the information there is sound, that there aren't typos, hopefully, um, and then you uh, put it out to the world. Absolutely. And Ebony, are there any resources available through the News Literacy Project um, that can help us better understand or explain this process? I'm glad you asked, Alicia. <laughs> yes, actually, we uh, just released um, in partnership with uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Peter Adams, and then uh, Cindy Otis, who's a former CIA um, officer, this, um, it's an infographic and it's called The Seven Standards of Quality Journalism. Um, it's fantastic. I believe that uh, we're gonna link to it in the chat box. So if you're interested, please go. It's a, it's a downloadable document. And then if you kind of go further and it's interactive, and if you go further into the document, we really explain what it means to have multiple sources, how to avoid bias, how to find credible sources, um, documentation, fairness, and to verify your sources. So we talk in pretty um, great detail about how to do that and to make that process easy so that folks understand uh, what the process is for quality, quality journalism and how journalists pursue 
uh, finding facts and then sharing those stories. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing. Sure. I know we'll probably have that pop up in our chat soon or we'll send it out, but I think it's a great, you know, infographic. I actually printed it um, and I'll have it up, <laughs> you know, as a PDF on my computer. It's great stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. And that's a great resource uh, to get some uh, insight into what journalists do to uh, fact check and make sure that they're releasing trustworthy news. Um, but on the other hand, um, as consumers, uh, we talked about this a little bit, uh, we do have a certain responsibility when consuming the news. How do we identify trustworthy news sources or discern fact from fiction? How, how can we differentiate opinion pieces from investigative journalism? Uh, if, um, who would like to get started on that one? Ebony? I'll let Lance go first and then I'll, sh I'll share a resource um, afterwards. <laughs> Perfect. Sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, yeah, so um, I, I think that as consumers, um, there's probably more responsibility now than there might've been in the past uh, just because so many of us as consumers, when we share stuff, it, it, it's not the way that it, you know, might have, you know, might have been in the past where, you know, you read something in the newspaper, you listen to a story on the radio, and it's kind of like, oh, well, I'll tell my friends about that, or like, I'll, I'll share that with them. If you tweet something, that's in pu the public domain. If you share something on Instagram, that's out there. And so if you're not being careful about what you're putting into the world, then, you know, obviously that's how misinformation spreads. So I think one of the main tips is to to do your best to identify the sort of like foundational news sources in whatever your slice of the country may be or, or your part of the world so you know whatever your daily newspaper is or your local radio station you might have some alt weekly some magazines uh things like that but then also you know other kind of blogs and, and news websites like just just do your best to take a look at okay, you know, as a consumer, does it seem like they're talking to experts? You know, does it seem like they're talking to folks who are knowledgeable about this? Are they sort of seemingly talking to just their friends or, or, or just talking to folks who don't have, you know, particular titles or, or have demonstrated the sort of level of expertise? Um, and, you know, and, and again, you know, I, I think it's tough because when you're kind of trying to get your foothold and, and you are a blogger or you might be someone who's building an audience, you might not be able to reach for, you know, a comment from the Department of Health or, or get that person on the record or something like that. But if you see that the person has at least made an effort to link to, you know, maybe sources like that or, or to demonstrate that they've done a little bit of research or done their homework, so to speak, that that's really a good way to, to, to sort of suss out if they're a, a good, uh, trustworthy news source. And just one other thing too, just in kind of helping you clarify some of that, you know, there, there's a sort of difference in the quality of how news sources um, share what's an opinion piece and what's just a reported piece from a staffer. So try your hardest to like really look closely. On WLRN, for example, anything that's an opinion, we have a, a sort of a header that calls it commentary so that our readers and our listeners know for sure this is the opinion of the person who's, you know, that you're about to read. And in most cases, I think news sites are getting better at like kind of putting opinion or, or something like that, or, or in my view at the top of, of those stories. So keep a sharp eye out for that. So you're not you know, sharing the thoughts of one person who might be totally removed from the actual you know, unbiased reporting process. And uh, just a quick follow-up question. Um, so as a consumer, uh, I think it's great. We're looking for, uh, uh, news sources that use experts as their sources. But now we're starting to see that sometimes those experts are not experts that we can trust. Uh, so is there, do you have any tips for us on how to, as a consumer, how to be able to figure that out or maybe people we can follow that will point that out for us? Any, any advice? So at uh, the news project, we have this resource that is probably actually my favorite one. Um, I use this in my personal uh, life and I encourage other folks to use it as well. And it's targeted for the general public and it's called uh, Sanitize Before You Share. And so we just identify like four quick steps to uh, make sure that whatever information you're about to share with the, with the understanding that if you engage with something online, then you are giving it a level of credibility. So even if you're liking it or if you are uh, sharing it or retweeting it. So even if you aren't like 
saying at the top of something that like, hey, I wholeheartedly agree with this. But if you are engaging with it, then realizing and recognizing that each of us, you know, Alicia is an actual influencer, but each of us in our own communities and in our families or in our spheres of influence, like you have power. Um, if you have a social media platform, even if you don't have tons of followers, like there are people who follow you. And because like you said it, then it must have some level of credibility because they trust you. And as somebody's trusted resource, um, it is our responsibility, responsibility, and I know that feels like a lot of like kind of pressure, but we try to make it simple. So the four steps, the first one is to just check your emotions and pause. Um, and this is really important because a lot of times how misinformation spreads is it really comes after your most sacred values and your emotions. So um, it seeks to make you really riled up about something, to make you really angry, um, to um, attack something that you hold very dear. Maybe it's your patriotism, your religion, um, some kind of sacred value that you hold. And so one like really quick thing to do is as you're like looking at something to think about, um, like I read this and it like angered me, or I saw this headline and I thought that was like deplorable whatever the case may be, and like take a moment before you share, cause you're like, I want everybody to see this awful thing that I saw. So we like never support this thing again, um, to just take a minute and pause. Open it um, if you choose to, and like kind of engage with the content to see like, is the point of this content to make me angry? Is that like the entire sole purpose of it? So just pause and check your emotions. And the second thing to do, um, I know in popular culture, we say, don't look at the comments. But a lot of times the internet is fast and trolls are really quick. And a lot of times people have done the work for you. People have commented on things and said like, oh, this isn't you know, from um, this particular rally. Like this isn't a picture of a rally. This is from something that happened in like 2010 in Australia. And they'll post the actual full length video or they'll say like, actually this clip was taken out of context. If you wanna watch the full interview, you can click here. But what this person is referring to isn't actually what that person said. Like people have oftentimes done the work for you. So I would suggest not going down a rabbit hole, but taking a look at the comments, glancing through them and seeing if somebody has posted an actual verified source that you can go to to get more information about this topic that just caused some kind of um, emotion out of you. And then the third thing is to do a quick search. And so I do this all the time. If I see something on Twitter and it like looks interesting or I want to engage with the content, then I'll just Google it and see like, are other people talking about this? Is this, is there like really, there was this one story um, that we talk about in one of our lessons where there was a hurricane, I believe it was in Florida actually. And no, I'm sorry, it was North Carolina. And there was like a shark, like swimming through the water, look like seemingly on like a freeway. And they, I mean, it went viral. People were like sharing this content, like there's sharks in New Bern, North Carolina. And so it's like, are other people reporting that there sharks in North Carolina or just this one tweet um, that's talking about it. And whenever people share it, it's that one thing. And then the final thing um, is to like ask. So there's often times where um, if you want to know where somebody got something from, if they, you know, write a statistic as their Facebook post or as their um, tweet, and you want to just like respond and say, hey, where'd you get this statistic from? Like, that's perfectly understandable. That's perfectly acceptable, especially in the context and the society that we live in. Um, people do it to us all the time. I feel free to always do that so you can make sure that you are checking your sources. And all of this takes seconds. Um, just to make sure that you are taking responsibility for your newsfeed and you aren't spreading um, information that isn't true any further. That is brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing that. And is there some additional advice you can give us uh, so that we can help children do the same process or what is your advice? Yeah, so um, the, while the sanitize to share is really simple. So we have a um, program, it's kind of like our flagship um, program. It's a virtual learning classroom called Checkology. It's free, it's online. You can go to checkology.org um, to check it out. And it's a resource specifically for educators to use in the classroom with um, students. But there is also a version of Checkology that is open to the general public. So if you're on um, this, if you're watching this and you're an educator, please feel free to take a look at that resource and sign up. Um, and if you aren't an educator and you're a parent or you're just a concerned citizen and you want to know how to maneuver um, through your, your news feeds, then you can also sign up. Again, all of it is completely free. Um, it really breaks these things down. It has lessons. It has um, quizzes. 
Um, I've gone through it myself. It's very good and it helps to digest this information in a really understandable way. Um, it is targeted for sixth through 12th grade. So if you have little, little ones, then maybe as a parent, you can um, take a look at our general public version and then you um, explain it to your children um, how best you see fit. Um, and then the last thing is we have an app called Informable. And Informable um, has a bunch of activities that also help um, people learn how to tell fact from fiction. It's fantastic. Um, if you just have some time in the doctor's office or where, well, I guess you're not going to the doctor's office right now, but if you have a few minutes and you wanna just go through an, an exercise or activity, please do so. Um, and it really kind of just strengthens your ability to like discern credible information. Um, I believe all of this is uh, available in the chat if you're interested in taking a look at these resources or downloading them for yourself. Wonderful. That is a lot of resources. Yes, that yes, deserves a <laughs> wealth of information. <laughs> but they're brilliant. And I had no idea that they were out there. So Ebony, thank you so much for sharing. Thanks for sharing. So this actually um, leads into a really great question that, you know, both yourself and Lance could jump onto this one. But in this time, um, we have a lot uh, that's going on, you know, in the world, a lot of different causes. Um, you know, movements that have been happening, social justice movements and, you know, human rights movements and all that. How can we during this time practice being anti-racist um, when we are consuming the news? Um, or how can we look at news through an anti-racist lens to spot um, a news story that has a racist bias? Um, yeah, I'm happy to talk on that. Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, it's, it, it can be tough. Um, I think that the first thing, the first thing that people really have to do is just get comfortable with being uncomfortable and mm -hmm. unlearning a lot of the behaviors they might have learned as consumers. Um, I, I think that a really big, really big thing um, in trying to look at a news through an anti-racist lens is understanding a lot about the news business as a whole, which is not a thing that's usually that well taught, but you know, for, for the most part, journalism is a is a thing that has been run by and, and founded by older white men. Um, and so that has driven a lot of coverage decisions, uh, staffing decisions, editorial planning decisions. And so I, I think that wherever you can find ways to consume news that, that takes a broader look, um, that, that has a broader editorial vision, and that has people who represent a broader editorial vision as well, um, you should try your best to seek those out. Um, and also, you know, just, just recognize what you're seeing when you see certain language that might on its face seem like relatively familiar, but can in many ways be coded. So, you know, we, when we talk about middle America or we talk about, you know, voters who are from, you know, rough neighborhoods or things like that, a lot of that is coded language that in, on one hand either can mean generally just you know, white voters or white Americans, or it can mean uh, people of color and, and, and black and indigenous people and, and, and people of color at large. And so, yeah, I think just really taking a very close and careful look at, at the things that you're seeing um, and, and trying your best to, you know, just do the, the research beyond that. I mean, I know that there's obviously a lot of great literature out there about, you know, practicing anti-racism in general and just in our day-to-day -day life, but there's also a good amount of, of that literature as well. Uh, when it comes to consuming the news uh, through that lens. And so uh, I'm sure that Ebony might have some uh, that she can direct folks to, but uh, but yeah, I think that's just a, a good practice in general is um, just unlearn a lot. A lot of unlearning these days. Ebony, do you have any resources or any anything to add? Um, I, I just agree with that. I think that was like a beautiful kind of summation of how to um, make some of these practices, like contextualize some of these practices because it is tough. Um, and, you know, while we really do believe that like diversifying voices is so important and uh, taking a look at kind of who is writing the stories, who the audience for their stories are um, and what that looks like. And again, um, I know this seems like, or it may seem like kind of a lot of responsibility for people who just wanna like be on social media. Um, and I get that, but there really is um, this kind of like other side of this conversation that, um, protects our right to free speech and holds the powerful accountable and like really tries to make sure that um, there is just like diversity. So what I usually suggest to people is to um, 
yeah, really diversify your news sources. So if you're always getting news from one place, then just see what other people are saying about an issue. And I think in doing that, you'll start to uh, learn patterns. You'll start to kind of understand how people position like the same kinds of conversations. Um, and like, it'll really kind of help you to hone in on certain um, aspects of journalism that you may want to follow like certain journalists and, and unfollow other journalists. But I think it's really important to um, just diversify uh, the voices that you allow to inform you. Um, and then you can make a really informed decision about what you're going to choose to believe and what you're going to choose to share um, and whose advice you're going to um, choose to follow and all those kinds of things. Um, we do have a resource, as a matter of fact. So on Checkology, there is a really, really great, um, it's probably one of my favorite uh, lessons. It's called um, Understanding Bias. And in that, we talk about well, I don't, but there's a wonderful journalist um, who talks about um, how to spot bias in the news. Um, and it's really great. It's really easy to digest. There's a quiz at the end to like make sure you understand it. Um, and it's just fantastic. Like when you go through it, you'll really understand kind of how certain things happen because we know that um, journalism is still an area where we're like really pressing for equity and, and pressing for, um, as I keep mentioning, like diversity of voice. And so it, it helps you to understand and spot uh, some of the areas in, in which like journalism hasn't always been fair, like how things can be slanted and bent and um, you know, uh, exaggerated and so on and so forth. So um, I would encourage you if you're interested in um, anti-racist education as it relates to journalism and as it relates to um, practices on your social media to uh, go through that uh, lesson on psychology. It doesn't take long, but it's extremely informative. Our team, um, our education team spent a lot of time like really understanding trends along with the journalists to really kind of um, hone in on what's really important when it comes to this conversation about bias and how to um, understand and like really like destroy some of those, those concepts that create uh, biases in uh, news media. Absolutely. And I appreciate you for sharing that. I think that, um, you know, as consumers, you know, we can't alter the way the news is delivered to us, but we can at least be more critical about what we read and how we interpret it and also what we take right. in. Um, and, and I think that sometimes that's called um, being a responsible uh, consumer, if you will. Um, so I actually think that that's really important. Thank you for sharing. Now, it leads me to my next question, um, which is, can you share, um, I know you've shared, we've shared a lot of resources and I know it might be an overload, but I think they're fantastic. But could you share any websites or social media accounts that we can follow in order to become more news literate ourselves um, or uh, any accounts we can follow that would benefit the youth to be more news literate? Uh, yeah, the first one that comes to mind is follow the Newslet Project, um, a <laughs> Newslet Project on Twitter. Um, and we also have um, some other accounts that we follow um, and that we share information from all the time um, where you can kind of, there's journalists that we follow and you can kind of see it from our Twitter account and you'll be able to like go through our list and see what are the uh, credible voices that we follow and that we retweet and share. Um, that information is also on our website. You'll be able to see some of the organizations and some of the partners that we work with to make sure that um, we are doing everything we can to spread uh, the message of news literacy education. Uh, so the most paramount uh, account would be Newslet Project on Twitter. Um, also visit us online at newsletproject.org. But we do a lot of tweeting, so follow us there. Thank you so much. Um, awesome. Lance? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I would just add really quickly. Um, I, I think that a lot of organizations are, are trying their best to sort of like you know, reach out to a mix of groups. So, um, you know, for example, with the, the New York Times, they have specific verticals that are um, related to gender issues. Um, they have a, a newsletter called Race Related that you can subscribe to if you're interested in just getting some more of that perspective. Um, and I think they just launched uh, either today or yesterday a NY, NYT Kids account on Instagram. So, oh, wow. um, so yeah, so, you know, I know we've, a lot of this is focused on educating, you know, uh, resources for children and, and young adults and so forth. So, um, yeah, so I mean, I, I think that some of those uh, are, are good places to start. Um, and, and as far as just other organizations that kind of take a, a, a look at this from a, a, a bit of a remove, but like try to make it understandable for folks, um, if you're really like trying to figure out fact and fiction around like political news or the election, PolitiFact is a great one to follow. Um, they're based in Florida. Um, but, uh, but yeah, they, they just really in very plain ways 
call it down the middle, like, you know, they, they have a scale that's basically like a lie or partially true or mostly true. And sometimes it's just pants on fire when somebody says something completely inaccurate. Um, and so, so yeah, so that's another good one. Um, if you're, if you're really trying to like separate all the noise um, these days with the political and election news. And uh, yeah, those are some of the main ones that come to mind. Uh, but obviously, like Ebony said, uh, you know, Newslet Project seems to have a treasure trove of, of things <laughs> to, to, help, to help you. <laughs> um, I, another one that came to my mind that I wasn't thinking of earlier is um, Scripps is a great resource um, to follow Scripps on their, um, on their Twitter account or also go to their website and kind of see a little bit about what they're doing. Um, and then another thing that I'll share, it's not an account to follow, but we just launched a podcast. I know this is like super promotional, but it's because I think these tools are so great. Um, and so, and I happen to work for an organization that I love and I think the mission um, is incredibly important and the content is amazing. Um, and so the, it's called, is that a fact? Um, it's a podcast that we launched just in September. So we're only a few episodes in, but I promise you, if you want to understand Russian interference, if you want to understand social media and how it works, if you want to understand like these seemingly really kind of dense topics, um, around misinformation, then the podcast, we bring on experts and we ask questions that you may have been thinking, or you wanted to know. Um, and I have personally learned so much from the podcast. So it's called, is that a fact podcast? It's brand new, but it is like truly, truly incredible. If you're interested in, in these topics. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing. Um, I definitely think that um, everyone's going online right now and just using their fingers and following, all these, accounts. Yes. <laughs> uh, following all these accounts. But I think, again, it's great for you to share that. Um, definitely during these times, it's good to have reputable resources um, and be able to differentiate, again, facts and misinformation. So I think it's really important, uh, which leads me to my next question is, you know, what does someone do or what are some ways um, that we as the consumers can voice our concerns? or criticisms about how a news story was delivered to um, journalism or media outlets? I don't know if Lance wants to tackle that. Sure, um, yeah, so, uh, you know, Ebony mentioned earlier, um, read the comments, and it's something that journalists go back and forth on, but I'm a, I'm a strong proponent of, of reading the comments and responding to the comments, unless they're totally off the handle or offensive, um, and I, there are other methods of dealing with that, usually blocking. But um, <laughs> I say all that to say, um, you know, you can, you can voice that in the comments um, because folks are checking that a lot more. I mean, um, we have a, at WLRN, uh, myself and uh, our engagement editor work a lot on kind of sifting through social media and making sure that we're like having a conversation that's not just like a one-way sort of thing where we present information and then just disappear. So um, that's definitely one method. Um, but I, I would say with that, I would just caution that, you know, we can't see everything. We're not on 24 seven. Um, so if it seems like we're taking a bit of time to respond or, or that's not proving fruitful, then definitely feel free um, to email us. Most news websites, including ours, have um, a sort of about section or, or, or a contact us section where you can usually uh, find uh, at least an email for someone that you want to reach out to. Um, and also, you know, like if our DMs are open, you can slide into those. Um, and, and let us know what your critiques might be or your feedback might be, because honestly, you know, again, to Alicia's point, like we're, we're constantly doing this, we're scrolling a lot. And so I might honestly see a Twitter DM before I see like an email. So, um, so yeah, so, so feel free to reach out to folks. Um, but again, with the caveats, like try to keep it respectful. I know that emotion can, can play a really big part in this, especially if you're passionate about a particular issue and feel like it might've been misrepresented, but you know, we're doing the best we can. We're trying to see as much as we can. So, yeah. Thanks so much. I'm Thanks so much. I'm sorry. Ahead, I'm sorry. I just wanted to um, add, I don't have anything to add to the question, but I think um, what Lance brings up about journalists is like, many and most journalists are like really are doing the best that they can and they are trying to present the most factual information as possible in a world where information is like constantly happening. So um, there's a story breaking, you know, every few moments. And so I think that um, just recognizing and acknowledging that um, there are a lot of journalists who are really trying to pack, practice standard-based journalism and who really are uh, trying to help their communities become more news literate, uh, particularly local papers. We love, love um, local journalists and local outlets who are bringing news directly to communities. And so I think what Lance, the point that Lance is making about um, journalists is like really important because it's easy to just 
you know, get upset um, and like feed off your emotions, but just to know that in a lot of uh, cases, like journalists really are working to make sure that we're informed. And I think in the landscape that we live in now, a lot of them are doing a fantastic job um, of keeping us on top of COVID-19 and the election and like the pandemic and like, you know, racial uprising and all of these other things that are happening um, that they're talking about all at one time. Absolutely. It's a lot happening all the time. Um, so I can imagine I actually, uh, the other day was thinking, wow, like I wonder to be a journalist right now, there's, there's so much going on. It's like, it takes you almost away from the investigative side of, you know, being a journalist and presenting news stories and it's just constant information. So that's really good to know that we can always reach out. Um, and then the next question is how can we use our social media influence to affect social change and educate our followers on news literacy? Um, I think very, very quickly uh, on that to recognize that you have a voice and to feel empowered to share information that you have verified that you feel very strongly about uh, to make sure that you are doing that as often as possible to your spheres of influence. I think one of the beautiful things about social media that doesn't always get you know talked about as much is that um, it allows people to reach whomever. Like now any of us have access to like reporters like Lance and any of us have access to tools and resources and people that we may wanna um, find out information from or get in touch with. Um, but we have this really beautiful and unique um, ability to share our opinions and share, share our voices on the internet. And so I think not taking that for granted and just doing anything. Um, and then as far as educating on news literacy, um, sharing information that you come across and making it really digestible for your community. Uh, one of the things that we just launched at uh, NLP is this ambassador uh, program that I'm very proud of. And a, a part of what it is, it's like um, using educators that are in communities on the ground to help us build our local footprint on the ground. So we want uh, them to kind of bring the message of news literacy education into their communities, but to do it in their own way, in their own language. Like however you know best to like reach Miami, whatever that looks like, However, you know, New Yorkers talk like we're a national organization and we aren't in, you know, every single space. And so, however, whatever conversations need to be had uh, to do that in a way that makes sense for your community to be um, to contextualize these conversations to make sure that they're culturally competent um, and speak to the people that you speak to. You have an audience and people um, trust what you say, I believe it or not, and want to hear from you. So share resources that you find, share information that you find. If you see something that's interesting and helpful, by all means, um, to use that content to raise awareness about things. We see that that's exactly what Black Lives Matter has done. That's exactly what um, all of these movements have done online is to take something that we felt passionate about and to raise our voices together um, to do so. And so it doesn't take a huge following or anything like that to be able to, to do that. So go for it. That's wonderful. And I love that you say it doesn't take a huge following because if you have just your close family as your followers on social media, you can make an impact right there. So wonderful. Um, also, I want to remind everyone uh, who is listening to the webinar that if you have any questions, feel free to add them in the chat and we will go over any questions you have at the end of the presentation, which we're almost there. <laughs> okay. So uh, with the elections around the corner, we are all being bombarded by news articles and advertisements referencing different candidates. How can we navigate our way through the misinformation in order to make the best decisions when voting? Um, would you like to take that one, Ebony? First? Well, I think Lance has a fantastic guide that I'm particularly interested in, but I would love to hear him talk about it, if you don't mind, Lance. Of course. I, I do not mind at all. Um, if you head to WLRN.org right now, or specifically to WLRN.us slash election 2020, um, you'll find our voter guide. Um, and that's just a, a little quick plug, but more broadly, um, I think that, you know, we've been talking a, a lot about news literacy and, and reaching out to um, and, and searching out uh, trustworthy news sources. And I think that's going to be your best bet. Um, you know, Ebony has talked about this a lot. and We've touched on it a lot tonight already that these ads, um, YouTube ads, these mailers in your mailbox, um, text messages, all this kind of stuff is designed to get an emotional rise out of you. And that's not always based in 
it's not always based in like truly, truly like vetted fact. Like in some cases, it might be a little misrepresentation of something, it might be citing an article from 2014, you know, all these sorts of things. And so one big thing for sure is like check the fine print. Um, and if you notice a, a lack of fine print or a lack of citing any particular source, that should immediately raise a red flag for you. So that's that's a big one for sure. Um, and and then again, you know, I think just like seeking out those sources and seeking out those voter guides and those election guides that kind of just you know spell it out very plainly. Like here's what this vote a vote on this will do. Here's what here's where this candidate has spoken about the issues, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, if, if some of you hop off this webinar later tonight and watch the debate later, like you know try to find sites that are doing fact checking. Um, NPR will be doing that, um, New York Times, Washington Post, uh, the Miami Herald, if you're in South Florida, a lot of these places will have stories coming out or, or live blogs going along with the debate to kind of help to separate that fact from fiction. Um, so, so seek those out wherever you can. And remember again that like, if you feel like an emotional response to something, somebody probably did that on purpose to manipulate you. And if you can't find a way to verify some of the claims, um, then that's probably like a, a, a tricky side. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for that. Um, and as we kind of wrap up, I would really love to know, and I'm sure uh, our listeners would love to know as well, can you share a little bit about um, both of you about how you ended up doing the work that you do? Uh, and also how can our viewers support your work uh, and organization in the future? I was trying to add our uh, election PSAs in the chat and I just like <laughs> completely fumbled, um, but I'll make sure that those are in there. They're just 15 to 30 second um, videos really quickly about um, the election. Um, it's nlp.org and then there's like a election 2020 PSAs, um, but I'll find that direct link and I'll add it in there. Um, okay, so the work that I do, so by by background, um, I am a coalition builder at heart um, and I love community engagement. I think it's extremely important in connecting issues to real people in real time. And so um, my background has been doing that for a number of different issues. So formerly I worked for the Affordable Care Act and uh, for a nonprofit organization. And we um, educated people on how to sign up on the marketplace, on um, what was in the law. I mean, this law is like hundreds of pages and how people can understand what this, these, this hundred page document means for their everyday life. Um, and so that was work that I, I loved. And then from there, um, Kind of started working for DC government, but also still um, in this like coalition building space where we took um, education policy and like really made it plain for communities, for parents and providers and students. Um, and then most recently at the News Literacy Project, um, I'm kind of continuing that pattern and uh, mobilizing educators on the ground to really, really kind of rally around news literacy education. And there are a lot of educators that are already doing this work and we wanna just support them and come alongside them. Um, again, because what I was realizing even before I got to NLP is like, there really is this need um, on social media. Like I'm thinking of my nieces and how they have grown up on social media their whole lives. And that was not my experience. Um, I didn't get social media until I was in college. And so growing up in an age where there's a, always information coming at you, where there's images and there's thoughts and like, how will you know how to think for yourself? And so one of the cornerstones of our work is teaching um, educators to teach students how to, or excuse me, yeah, how to think, not what to think. So it's like how to investigate and, and not to be like suspicious of everything, but to question things and how to use your own mind to investigate uh, information that you see because the information landscape is incredibly complex and because there's constant a constant bombard of information coming at you at one time. And given the world we live in now, I just could not think of a more worthy cause to um, rally for. And so I love this work. Um, I love protecting the cornerstone of our democracy. Um, and I love um, being able to rally educators and communities around news literacy education, because I just believe that um, without it, our uh, society will suffer greatly. So yeah. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it relatively brief. Uh, the short answer is that I'm nerdy and nosy. Um, so that's just how I got into this. But, um, but in all honesty, um, you know, I've just, I've always really cared a lot about the news. And once I kind of got into it, I, I, I started writing for my college newspaper. Um, and that's kind of where the bug first bit me. And 
um, just continued from there and I continued to study it in graduate school for it. And so once I started working full time at the Herald um, as a reporter and really working on like local government and, and covering local community news, um, from then on, I was kind of just like, okay, this is it. And like, what I really want to focus in on and hone in on is like making things plain for folks as much as I can, like, you know, just right here on like the street and the communities that I drive through and like the neighborhoods that I pass through and so forth. And so that's continued to kind of inform my career tra trajectory to this point. And uh, yeah, I, I'm not tired of it, so. Awesome, thank you both so much. I think that wraps it up. I think Paola, you might be on mute. There we go. <laughs> Thank, <Be back>. you. <laughs> Thank you so much. This was a great conversation. Those were all the questions we had ready for you, but we do have a few questions from the audience. And we're going to start with Jordan. They ask, what can I tell my parents who are much older that yes, the media can be fake sometimes. However, not everything online is fake news. My parents think that racism is only still bad because the media is making it seem bad. While I know this is not the case, it is hard to know what the best thing is to say to them so they understand what I understand. Um, thank you for that question, Jordan. Um, it's a great one and one that, um, I experienced talking to uh, my parents, not along the same line, but in terms of helping to understand fact from fiction. Um, and so we recently released uh, resources for the general public, and I will make sure that link is in the chat box. Um, and it will kind of help you really understand uh, a lot of the concepts that we're talking about and then be able to explain them to your parents. So we break them down um, very plainly so that anyone can use them. And we uh, specifically kind of worked with um, an older population to make sure that how we're talking about this information like translates to um, that audience. Oh, thank you so much. Grace um, put it in the in the chat box. So I really urge you to take a look at it. I hope you find it helpful um, and reach out to um, us on at the News Literacy Project, me on Twitter or um, NLP in general. And if you find these resources helpful and you need more or if you want something even more specific, um, I'm personally happy to help you because I think that conversation is really important um, and um, I'm happy to help you be able to reach them. Yeah, and I, I would just add really quickly to that. Um, I know it can be tough, um, and I've experienced this even with my own parents. Um, you know, even though they're the parents of journalists, it, it, of a journalist, it does not make a difference. Um, but I've been able to, you know, the, the main thing I've done, and you know, this is no slight, or at least no particular slight to uh, my my friends and and folks who work in television news and things like that, but. I think that diversifying their news diet will probably go a long way because um, I, I think that older um, older folks like tend to just only watch television news and like cable news and those outlets have a very specific kind of like way that they want to present the news um, and again you know kind of goes back to that drumming up emotion point and so if they can find other sources that you know are just going to tell it to them plainly tell it to them straight like that that goes a long way um, in, in helping to really just help them get get the sense that like the media doesn't have a perceived agenda um, or at least not the whole media or anything like that. Um, so so I, I would definitely suggest that helping them just seek out other news sources where they can. Um, and, and to the particular point you raised about you know racism only being bad because the media make, is making it seem bad. I, I think that wherever you can point them to writers, um, and this is one instance where I would actually support, you know, sort of sending them to like op-eds or opinion pieces and things like that. Because I think a lot of journalists, especially this year, have kind of been sharing their experience about, you know, not they, there's not a, a desire, I think, for journalists to want to have to talk about these tough things, but this is what we're presented with. And a lot of them have been very forthcoming about that. So wherever you can find those, or if you find stuff that you're reading and consuming and you think, hey, this might help it get the point across better than I can, then definitely like forward those things along, print them if you have to and, and send them to your folks, um, whatever, whatever helps you uh, kind of get the message across. That is great advice. I feel like we all have someone in our circle that we need to have that conversation with. So that's wonderful uh, resources and advice. Thank you both um, Lance and Ebony. Um, Grace is asking, is there anything about Miami for Lance or DC for Ebony that makes it unique from a journalistic point of view? 
Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> so, I mean, the thing about my, um, and the reason why this sort of like Florida man thing became so popular, um, honestly, is because Florida has really great, at least for journalists, public records laws. So like every single detail of like everything that happens, um, good, bad, or indifferent is usually public, uh, public records. So we're able to just like build on that and, and tell stories that way. And so, and also Miami, you know, it's just a, it's a, a sunshiny place. It's a, it's a nice place to kind of like do, do your thing. And it's, it's close to the islands. It's close to a lot of world, you know, <laughs> world economy for better or for worse. And so I think that that's a part of it, but also, you know, just the melting pot that it is um, and, or the stew that it is, depending on who you talk to, um, you know, there's just so many different kinds of cultures here. A lot of cultures that, um, you know, might have in the past felt a little more silenced um, that are, are getting a seat at the table more and more and, um, you know, just kind of grappling with all of that um, and, and, and trying to make sense of all that together, um, I think is what, what kind of makes it the place it is. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Have, do you have any insight, Ebony? Um, I don't think I have anything um, to add um, about the like journalism landscape here. Um, I think this year has just been like pretty unique um, as it relates to um, the media landscape in general. Uh, so yeah, I don't think I have anything to add to what Lynn shared. Okay, perfect. In that case, that was our last question. So uh, before we wrap this up, do any of our speakers have anything that they have upcoming that they would like to promote to share with us? Yes, actually. So uh, we have a professional development training called Newslet Camp um, for educators. It's happening tomorrow. It's specifically for Miami-based educators. Um, the link is in the chat. Um, if you'd like to register, even share it. Maybe you're not an educator, but you uh, want to share it with others. We're going to go over a ton of these concepts that we talked about today. They'll be gone over there, but in much greater detail um, with experts who um, do this work. And so uh, we hope to see you there. Um, if you're interested, it is free um, and it's virtual. Um, I'll be there if that's any consolation. <laughs> um, and so uh, hopefully I'll see many of you um, tomorrow during our Miami News Lake Camp. And it's in a partnership with uh, Univision. So we're really excited about it. That's wonderful. And even if we are not educators, do you think that would be a good fit for us to join? It is specifically tailored for educators. Um, so there, the conversation is like based on kind of how to teach some of these skills. Um, so it probably would make most sense for educators. Um, and we have other things kind of coming down the pipe that are for the general public. Um, so I would skip this one and just kind of wait till we have um, more opportunities that are just kind of like for the general public. We are doing also a fall webinar series that is open to anyone. So every Thursday in October, we have, um, we go over these concepts. We talk about misinformation and disinformation, um, news literacy. We really like go into um, pretty great detail and that's led by one of my colleagues. And so that one is open to the general public. And the next one is next Thursday. And then there's even one the following Thursday and they're different topics. So feel free to register for those. We'll also make sure that that's in the chat box. Um, so if you aren't an educator, then I would push you toward the fall webinar series. But if you are an educator, if you know educators, then the Newslet camp is for you. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Lance, do you have anything upcoming that you would like to promote? Uh, nothing of a particular note, just um, you know, starting at noon uh, on our airwaves tomorrow, we have uh, the Florida Roundup, which is like a sort of just discussion program. And um, so at noon, it's a statewide sort of show and it's talking a lot about the election and things like that. So if you kind of just want to get a sense of where things stand, if you're in Florida or South Florida, um, and also you can, you know, call into that show and, and it's participatory. So if you have questions that are more specific along those lines, um, that, that starts at noon. And then at one, there's the South Florida Roundup, uh, which is a much more locally based show. And we'll be talking about some election related things, but also pandemic and you know, just all the all the things that are <laughs> happening. So if you tune into those, uh, you can stream it on WLearn.org. Um, we have uh, an app that you can download on, on iOS and Android. And um, and if you you know just want to tune in the old school way, it's ninety one point three FM if you're in uh, Miami. So. All right, wonderful. If you want to tune in in your car, um, and uh, Alicia, do you have anything you'd like to share before we wrap up to promote? 
No, I just encourage everyone to get involved and use all of the resources today. Um, again, I typed it in the chat earlier, but you can follow my blog at heyalicia.com. Um, connect with me on Instagram, um, uh, uh, Twitter, Facebook, all of the above. I'm, I'm connected on everything. I think I have a Twitch. I don't really use it, but um, I'm <laughs> connected on everything. Um, and I recently did start a podcast, the Chit Chat Corner Sarah podcast. Um, and so we are releasing episodes um, uh, every week, every two weeks, sometimes <laughs> it depends on how, how life is going at the moment, but I definitely encourage you all to connect. Um, I love to have guest speakers. I would love to have Ebony on one day or Lance on one day to just talk about a multitude of things um, that I believe are important and, and just sharing our um, common interests. So that's all for me. Wonderful, subscribe to her podcast. And okay. for those, uh, we have a few people who just joined us. Um, maybe the time change, <laughs> we will be uh, sharing this uh, re webinar replay via email um, if you registered for this webinar. And we will also be posting it on our YouTube channel um, so that you can go revisit there. We will also on the description share all of the links that we mentioned during the discussion. And that's it. Thank you so much, um, Ebony and Lance, for sharing all of your insights with us today. I It was very, um, uh educational and i learned so much and uh i really appreciate you taking the time to join us thank you so much for the opportunity it was great chatting with you all um and yeah i look forward to seeing you at some of our upcoming events yeah thanks so much for doing this you all um, i hope it was helpful it definitely was well thank you so much everyone we will have a new webinar coming up next week um and we will be sending an email with all the details thank you also grayson and, and chris for helping us in the chat behind the scenes and alicia as helping as a, a moderator see you next time no bye everyone bye, bye everyone